There's a book in the Bible, it's called Romans. And many people think that it is one of the best books in the Bible, uh, one of the greatest uh, books that the Apostle Paul ever wrote. It actually is one of my favorite books in the Bible. And uh, there's a chapter in there that I think that I've memorized uh, and have those, some of those verses is at, at the central, at the core. And I think they're important for us all. You know, as we were worshiping, I was thinking of the man from the Gadarenes. And some people this morning, I believe that God wants to set you free of some things. Uh, he wants you to get past some things that are from your past, and He wants you to go and move on to new things. There was a man in, the, in Mark chapter 5 where he spoke about with the man from Gadarenes, he couldn't be bound by anybody. See, some of the things that you bind believers are not things that other people could bind us. You know, there's some things that only God can set us free of. That man was, he was bound, and it says that shackles and chains, nobody could chain him. He would just break them. You know, there's, there's a, some people in the, I believe in this world that they can't be bound by people. They can't be bound by intimidation. But Satan's device is just, God wants to break us free of some things that man can't bind us with, but God is the only one who can set us free of those things. This morning in Romans chapter 8, I'll share with you guys Romans 8 because it's not uh, something that I'm going to give to you. Uh, many years, again, said it's the greatest work of Paul. He speaks about justification. He speaks about sanctification. He speaks about faith. He speaks about grace. But at the center of that book, again, one of the greatest books, and I certainly think it's one of the greatest books, is Romans 8. Some people talk about Hebrews 11, and they talk about the faith chapter, and yes, that's a great chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, they call it the love chapter, and that's a great chapter too as well. Uh, they talk about the tongue in James chapter 3, and that's a great chapter. Uh, I could, uh, this morning, I speak to you about Romans chapter 8, verse 1, where it says, There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, but those who walk after the Spirit. I could talk to you about Romans 8, 18, where it tells us that the, the sufferings of this present time are not worth being compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. We could talk about Romans 8, 15, where it talks about us being adopted into the family of God. And that's a great privilege that's given to us, because when you're adopted into the family of God, you can never be disowned. We can talk about Romans 8.28 where it says, And we know and believe that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Yes, those are things, but you know what I want to talk to you about this morning is Romans 8.31-39. to There are three things that you're, going, that you're going to get, I pray, this morning from that. These three main points as we read those verses are uh, an overpowering confidence, an overwhelming love, and an overcoming attitude. See, that's something that's important for every born-again, blood boy, child of the Most High God, to have an overcoming attitude. In Romans chapter, as, as we prepare for this, uh, Paul said something in Romans chapter 1, verse 15, as he was beginning to write this book. He said, so as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. See, there was a, there was a process that Paul had to go through as he was learning and growing as a disciple. You know, he had to become ready to preach gospel. This is the gospel for all of us as believers. And it should come across any time that the word of God is brought forth, is that Jesus died so that we, he could receive the penalty for our sins. He rose from the grave to give you power over sin, but then he ascended to the right hand of the Father. There are a lot of believers that I believe that they're, they're at the first level of the gospel, where they are uh, appropriating the freedom and the forgiveness. But there's more to that, more to the gospel than just freedom and forgiveness. God wants us to walk in power over sin, but also to have an ascended lifestyle, to know that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father and that He's praying for us. Yes, we're servants, but we're also sons. You know, there's, there's a destiny and there's an identity that God wants us to appropriate. And that comes with an overcoming uh, confidence, an overcoming attitude. It comes with an over understanding of His overwhelming love for us, but then also that overpowering and overwhelming 
and love that he has for us. So the first thing that I want to break down for you is an overcoming attitude. As we read these verses, what I see in these verses is that Paul has like an attitude. He's not really asking a question. Have you ever asked a question and you already know the answer? Well, I mean, he's asking a rhetorical question. He already knows the answer. Uh, so when he asks these questions of us, he says, what are we going to say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And yes, I gave that to you like in our uh, modern vernacular. He's kind of like, you got to put a little bit of attitude into that. What are we going to say to these things? What is it that you're going to say to the things that are going to come and challenge you? Because later on in those verses, there are some things that he's going to name. There's 17 things that he's going to name. And there's a reason why there's 17 of them. And I'm going to break that down to you. So the first one is this. is What are you going to say to the things? Oh, have your way, Mr. Satan. Do what you want in my life. Or is there something that's going to rise up inside of you and say, no, 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 not on my watch. There has to be like a righteous attitude and an indignation in us and in the believers that when something comes contrary to the word of God or one of his precious promises, something rises up inside of us. And that's okay. That's okay. Because I've seen some people get an attitude. You know, sometimes they get an attitude about other things. But we, we can get an attitude with the devil about him coming and trying to encroach on what God paid the price for us to have. Amen. So it says, what do you say to these things? And there's another question. If God is for us, who can be against us? Think about that for a moment, because I dwell on that. You know, I grew up in the city and uh, in New York, and you know, one of the things was is that you were about as strong as your, as your backup was. If you didn't have backup, then guess what? You were out all, all by yourself. But if you had a lot of friends, guess what? You know what? The, people were less likely to mess with you. Well, think about this. Is that the, the, the enemy, Satan, is a bully. He's looking to mess with you. You know, what you have to remind him of is you got backup. That's right. Your backup is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. How powerful is your backup? That your backup created Satan. You got to remind Satan of who he is. That he's nobody special. That he's a created being. That he's underneath God's feet. That God triumphed over them. Over him. And I'm going to explain to you that because sometimes people think a triumph is just a victory. It's not just a victory. It's an overwhelming landslide. So then it goes on and there's some questions that uh, Paul is asking. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely, freely give us all things? And I think about that. You should think about that. If he gave his best, whatever you are asking for, that's like second, third, fourth, or fifth. He gave his son. Think, of, think about this, parents. It's one thing for you to give your life. How many of you love somebody so much that you would give your life for somebody? Without question, in a moment's notice, like that. It's not even a decision. I saw hands go up all over the sanctuary. Well, think about this. Think about that person that you would give your life for, but now you, you are asked to give that person's life. Some of you are like, man, now, now, okay, it's one thing to give your life, but now the person that you love, that you would die for, that's what God the Father did. He loves you so much that he was in perfect unity with Jesus as he gave his life to sacrifice for you and I. It's one thing to have a love that you would give your life for someone. It's a totally other thing. That's why I thank God for his love, that his love is such that he would give what mattered most to him for you and for I. How valuable are we? How important are we? How loved are we? So if he would make, if God the Father would make that sacrifice for us and that Jesus, it says in John chapter 10, verse 18, it tells us that uh, he, no man takes his life. He gave his life freely. So sometimes people forget that Jesus was in perfect unity with the Father and uh, they gave, that Jesus went and made that sacrifice for you and for I. How great is that love? So if that sacrifice would be made, all the other things would come along with it as well. So think about that and think about it and meditate on it because sometimes people think, well, you know, I don't deserve that. Honestly, none of us really deserve anything that God gives to us. We get it all because He's good. Not because we're good, right? I mean, that's God's grace. 
His grace is Him giving us something that we don't deserve. His mercy is us not getting what we deserve. That's what grace and mercy are. Then there's another question. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. So there's like an attitude that Paul has. He's not asking for somebody to answer that question. He's like, hey, who's going to bring anything against me? Because you know what? Jesus already paid. There is no such thing as double jeopardy. In, in law, you cannot be crime, cr charged twice for the same crime, right? They call that double jeopardy. There's a lawyer in the house, so she can tell us. <laughs> you get charged with it one time, that's it. Jesus paid the penalty. There is no charging you again with it if you will stand upon the word and not allow the enemy to bring that charge against you. So you gotta like have an attitude. When he comes in with you and he starts whispering lies to you and reminding you of your past, some of us need to remind him of his future. <laughs> He's going to the lake of fire. Some of us need to remind him of his past, that he got defeated at the cross of Calvary. What he thought was his greatest victory actually was his greatest defeat. So who's going to condemn you? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us. Now these are some things that I think about. And I shared it this morning because it was as I was praying, I remember a time that somebody was standing against cancer, this couple. Arlene was, and she, and she wrote a book about it. And she was standing against cancer, and there was a bad report. And I was speaking with Gary, her husband, and I was like, Gary, what are you guys willing to do as we face this? And Gary looked at me, and I remember, I had to remind him that I was his pastor. And he looked at me with such ferocity. He goes, whatever it takes, whatever it costs. And I was like, wow, you know what, they're going to get through this. Because with that kind of determination, we already know that the outcome is already determined. Well, that's the kind of attitude that Jesus Christ had when he took the cross of Calvary for you and for us. He said, whatever it costs and whatever it takes, he's willing to do it. Why? Not because he had to take the nails, but because he wanted to take the nails into his palms. With nail pierced palms and blood stained fingers, Jesus took the cross of Calvary because he loves you and I that much. With that kind of love, well, how could we not have a, and that kind of backup, how could we not have an overcoming attitude as we're facing difficulties and circumstances? Let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 35, and we'll talk about the overwhelming love. Now I'm sharing this with you guys. Because I had to wrap my mind and my heart around this. Trials come and difficulties come, because they're going to come. But now, instead of thinking, well, you know what, how, uh, you know, imagining a, a bad outcome, I, I imagine the good outcome because I remind myself. I remind myself that Jesus overcame and he gave me the victory, that he, he, he has triumphed over the enemy. Our attitude is important as we face trials and difficulties because attitude determines outcome. It also, attitude also determines altitude. Some people go into things, and this is what I learned is, and when I was a wrestler in school, if you were defeated before you entered into the ring, guess what? It was only a matter of time until that outcome came to pass. You were going to get pinned. But you had to make sure that you were go went into the match with a winning attitude, that you were going to win. And this is what I want to plead with you, family, because the enemy wants to make you feel defeated. And he'll whisper lies to you, but if you go into that fight, you're, we are already setting ourselves up for failure if we're imagining a poor outcome. We have to think through the Word of God, and I know I have to do. I have to remind myself, just like I'm telling you, I have to remind Satan that he's defeated. Because sometimes he whispers lies, and, and he has a voice. Circumstances have a voice, don't they? Circumstances can start screaming for your attention. Bills can start screaming for your attention. Uh, doctor's reports can start screaming for your attention. But the voice of God has to scream for our attention. And we have to listen to his voice over above the voices of this world that would speak to us. In Romans chapter 8 verse 35 it says this. He's still asking questions. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Tribulation is trials, difficulties. There is no difficulty. And think of this. There is no difficulty that Jesus wouldn't go through 
for you. That, sometimes we think of that as, as us, but I believe that that's Jesus for you. There's nothing he won't go through for you. I mean, think about the shameful death that he endured. That was a shameful death that he endured on the cross of Calvary. He endured it. Why? Because he loves you and I. Then it goes on to say, a peril or famine or nakedness. Some people put clothes on onto the people that have been crucified. But you know what they did? When they crucified people, they stripped them very often. So they were naked as they were being crucified. It is, it is well thought of that Jesus had no clothing on because they wanted to shame him and go through the worst possible death that he could possibly receive uh, so that they could inflict the maximum amount of punishment upon him. What peril, what sword? As it is written, for your sake, all day long we are committed as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, this is the yet. All of that went through, all of that was stated for a reason. Yet, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. I want you to know that, that the, the number of things that were stated was seven. The number seven is significant as we study scripture because there were seven things stated because what they wanted to get across is that there was a perfect love. Number seven is the number for perfection as we study the Bible. So as you're reading that, seven things were named because they wanted to get across, the writers wanted to get across that God's love for you is perfect. It's perfect for, towards you. There is no blemish in it. That God loves you unconditionally and everlasting. And this is the illustration that's being painted to, for you and I. You know, sometimes we think, well, a conqueror. That's what I, I felt like. Well, yet in all these things, we are conquerors. That's not, the, that's not what that scripture verse is saying. It says, yet in all things, we are more than conquerors. I heard this illustration a while back, and I thought, man, that's really good. I thought that was really good. And it was a, an older time preacher. And for those people that feel like we need the new thing, I want to tell you, I like a lot of the old stuff. I like a lot of the hymns, and I like it, because you know what, there's stuff that's in there that's like timeless. So this man was sharing, and I don't remember the preacher's name, but he shared a story about two boxers going into to fight. And he said, was saying that this is being more than a conqueror. It was his championship athlete. He's big and he's in shape. And he was ready and he was training and he was a force to be reckoned with. Well, he goes in and he's facing this other boxer and they're both in shape. It's a heavyweight championship. And uh, the, and the story that he told it was for a million dollar purse, but you know, a million dollars isn't what, isn't what it used to be. So we'll, we'll raise it to like a hundred million. How about that? <laughs> so they're fighting for a hundred million dollar purse. They go in and they fight and they're beating each other up, beating each other up. And it's back and forth and back and forth for the first round, the second round, the third round. How many of you know how many rounds are in boxing? Twelve. All right, twelve or fifteen. So let's say fifteen for this one. I'm gonna, well, twelve, but let's say fifteen. So let's say 15 rounds. So finally at the 15th round, the, the one guy comes in and he knocks out the other guy. And he, he beats him and he defeats him and it's a KO. They bring him up to the front as an, the ring announcer raises his hand. He says, this is the heavyweight champion of the world. He receives $100 million as the purse. And then a little girl, a little woman who's about 120 pounds comes up and she, she's the wife of the, the victor, the champion. And she grabs the check. <laughs> He's a conqueror. She's more than a conqueror. I was like, man, that's perfect. Jesus fought the fight and gave us the victory. We, as the bride of Christ, received the benefit of it. Wow, that's amazing. The one who said there is no price too high to pay. Whatever it is, whatever it costs, whatever it takes. He says that you are more than conquerors through Christ who loves you. Now, what I want to explain to you is what a triumph is. Because in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, it tells us that, we, that Christ has made us to triumph. This is what a triumph is. A triumph is when a, a conquering general defeats an army and plunders a nation. That they're brought into Rome and the conquering general is paraded throughout the streets with a defeated enemy before him and behind him in shackles and chains. 
with all the plunder of the nation, as every one uh, of the, the nation that won celebrates the conquering general. Get, get this picture. It's not like, okay, you barely won that fight. No, it was an overwhelming defeat. It was a slaughter. Your defeat of the enemy. And that's what we got to get as a picture. Because too often it's like, well, I just want to get by. Instead of, no, the enemy is completely, utterly defeated in our lives. That the victory that Jesus paid for, for you to have, he has caused us to triumph as more than conquerors against every trial that's named. All of those seven things that were named, that perfect love that he has towards you is now being received into our spirits and being shared with us so that we would have an overpowering confidence. So the first, the third one is this, is overpowering confidence. And this is what Paul is saying. The first one is an overcoming attitude. The second is the overwhelming love that Christ has for us. And the third one is this, is this overpowering confidence. And that's what the Lord would want you to have. He would want you to have, and he wants to download it to us. And I'm not saying I'm there. I'm with you. I want to continue to have this and I continue to depend on him and continue to stay tapped into the power source so that when trials come, I'm not seeing it from this or this or this, but I'm seeing it through this. It says in Romans 8, 38, I am persuaded, persuaded. I am fully confident. I am overpoweringly confident. That's what persuaded. There is no talking me out of this. Remember the questions that he was asking. Paul was like, listen, this is the way it is. I'm asking you a question, but I already know the answer. I remember my mom and my dad asking me questions, and they already knew the answer. I was like, why are you asking me the question? You know the answer. <laughs> they were really just emphasizing a point to me. That's what a rhetorical question is. Just emphasizing a point. What are you going to say to these things? What shall you say to these things? If God before you, who can be against you? Remind yourself and remind the enemy of the backup that you have. Remind yourself of how much love that God has for you. Here's God. God is ridiculously biased towards you. That's the way I see it. Ridiculously biased. There are some people that you're biased. You know, sometimes you, you guys know. Sometimes I'm like, come on, it's not really that way. You just love this person a real lot. You're just seeing them. You're seeing them through eyes of love. But let me, God is biased towards you. He shows favoritism towards his children. And this is what, how that favoritism is played out. He shows you favor in just the way that you need it. Sometimes that love is a kick in the pants. For me it was. It's like, hey, you know what? God's told me things that if anybody else told me, I'd be on. I'd be upset. But he tells me it because he loves me. And he wants Amen. the best for me. So Paul's saying this. Is he, there's an overpowering confidence that he has. He says, for I am persuaded that death, nor life, Hey, Paul was fully persuaded in my book. You know why? Because he had his head chopped off for the gospel. That's one of the things that really did it for me. When I was studying, I was trying to get 11 out of 12 men. Some people won't even die to self. They wouldn't even give me a ride to the airport when I needed one. I'm like, are you kidding me? These guys gave their life? If it was a lie... Don't you think at the last moments before they were killed, they would have been like, okay, I was just kidding. <laughs> you know, Jesus isn't really Lord. He's not the Son of God. You know, I want to preserve my life. No, Peter was crucified upside down. And the man who denied him, people talk about his denial, but what he ended up saying was, crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy of dying the way that my Savior did. Man, that's a radical kind of love. They receive that love and they, they have that type of conviction and confidence. So Paul is saying that because he was beheaded. And one of the things that he did before he was beheaded is he preached to the people that were trying him. He didn't beg for mercy. He preached the gospel to them. He says, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor powers, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Wow. Ten things were written there. First was seven, and then they go to ten. 
And there's a reason why seven. Seven was to emphasize God's perfect love for us. Ten is God's authority. God's authority was established there. He wanted us to get that his authority is established over all of the things that were labeled there. He wants us to have as our identity an overcoming attitude, an understanding of his overwhelming love, and for us to have an overpowering confidence because Jesus said, whatever it costs, whatever it takes, I love them that much that I want them to have a victory. I want them to triumph against every trial, every tragedy, every circumstance, every sickness. This is where you and I are. We're destined for victory. There's no detours in our destiny. That God has set us up all up for success. One day we'll be glorified. But while we're going there, there's going to be a testimony after testimony after testimony of God's great glory, God's great power in our lives. That's what Romans 8 says to me this morning. That's what Romans 8, that's how I can face tomorrow. Because God took me this far by faith, he took you this far by faith, and he's not going to leave you. The same God that was yesterday, the same God he is today, and the same God he's going to be tomorrow. You can trust in that. You can take that to the bank. Amen. Family, as you would, as the worship team comes forward. We don't want to ask God for anything this morning. We just want to celebrate who he's created us to be. We want to celebrate that he has paid the price. He has an attitude, whatever it takes, whatever it costs, so that he set us up to be more than conquerors. That that $100 million purse has been given to us blessings and promises and heavenly places for us that we just need to go and withdraw on those things and have confidence in our Heavenly Father that he has caused us to overcome every difficulty. There is no such thing as an addiction that can hold again down a born-again child of God. Sickness and infirmity has to flee before us. Poverty and lack, that's not in the Bible. God is going to give us abundantly more than we can hope, ask, or imagine. He's going to give us more than we need for every good work. As we make those steps of faith, we don't need to beg anybody for anything. Nobody stands in the way of your destiny. There is nobody that powerful to stand in your way. God has already set you up for success. What shall we say to these things if God be for us? Who can be against us? This is what I kind of envision. Better get out of my way. Better get out of your way. The worst thing that you can ever do to a child of God is get in their way. In the Abrahamic covenant, it says this, that God will bless those who bless him, and he will curse those who curse them. You know what I actually pray for people that come against the children of God? I pray for mercy for them. Because I know my father is a lot more powerful than the world's father. This morning, family, I want to ask those people, who are those people that want to celebrate the King of Kings? Who is it that wants to celebrate God and the victory that he's already given to us? And walk in that. And worship him and bless him and say to the enemy, what are you going to say to these things? Well, I got a few things I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you right now. I'm going to tell you in my prayer closet. So come and let's worship the Lord. Let's celebrate. This is, as you worship, there's some things that are coming in and natural. I'm not saying we deny those things or we lie about those things. Maybe you're fighting the good fight of faith. I'm not saying you should lie. But what I am saying is that we should celebrate right now as if we have it because we do. If you need to be set free from something, you're not waiting to be set free. You're already set free. Come on, there's got to be some more conquerors here. You can't sit in your seat. Be a conqueror. You gotta be paraded through the streets. Sometimes we think it's humility to not have attention put on us. You're called to be the light of the world. Here's what I say if you don't stand up for something, you'll fall for anything. Let's worship the Lord.
The only thing that you'll bow your knee to is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You pledge an allegiance to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. You're declaring that you're not a citizen of this world, that you're a citizen of heaven. Let's sing that, let's sing that chorus again. called you to a life of significance. That you're a chain breaker. And God wants you to know and to have and continue to walk in an overcoming attitude. Knowing his overwhelming love. Having an overpowering confidence so that the captives could be set free. You're not just having your chains broken. But your chain breakers, setting the captives free. Amen. Hallelujah. I see some of you entering into heaven on that day. We're living this day for that day. Those two days that matter most. And you're entering into a triumph. And all the people before and all the people behind are the people who had their chains broken here on the face of the earth. I'm getting shivers. People are getting set free because they came into contact with you. The power of God being released through your life. You're not just having your chains broken, but you're becoming chain breakers. 
setting people free. Lord, I pray into that. I thank you, Lord, for that vision. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in my brothers and my sisters, Lord, that not only are they being set free from limitations and labels and lies, but, Lord, that they're setting other people free. Lord, that they're going viral. Lord, that your presence is going viral. Lord, we're not impressed by COVID. Lord, that your presence is going to go viral. There's going to be a pandemic outbreak of your presence. Yeah. Lord, at the epicenter, Lord, that they would, they would find us, Lord, as contagious Christians, yeah. that your presence would spread like wildfire throughout the community, throughout our workplaces, throughout our communities, Lord. And that there would be a pathway and a crowd of people that have been set free, radically on fire for you, Lord. Yes. Not religious, but having a relationship with you, Lord. We bless you and we honor you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus said, whatever it takes, whatever it costs, so that we can be more than conquerors and that we can triumph here on the face of the earth. We give you honor. We give you praise. We give you glory as we receive the victory that you paid for with your son's blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.